Alabama as we bring you in to the ballpark. And a big game for both of these teams. Auburn is trying for the first time to sweep us, or excuse me, win a series this year. And Christian Moore drives it out to Stanfield in center field for the first out. Pretty well hit, but Stanfield equal to the task. Will Cannon is uh, making a special start for Auburn. Yeah, Will's been their best guy at the back end of the bullpen, but today he's, uh, he's trying to get them off to a good start. The first innings of these games both have been where a lot of runs have been scored. So you've got you've got your guy out there, whether you call him an opener or not, uh, we'll see. But they're putting one of their best guys against the top of this this L, this Tennessee lineup. Cannon has had nine appearances out of the bullpen. This is his first start. He's only worked 13 innings, as you might expect. 15 hits allowed. He has walked seven and struck out 17. So well over a strikeout per inning. But this is new territory for him as a starter for the first time. He brings a really good arm to the mound. And as we've already seen, Tennessee's not going to take a lot of strikes. I mean, they, they're they swinging from get-go. He, he started the more off with a breaking ball and got it off the end of the bat. And he went right at, he's going right at Burke, who's, Burke's one of the best guys in the whole country. No uh, question. He's hitting over 400. He's on a 21 game hitting streak. Here's the one two pitch with one out Moore having lined out to center field. And that is tapped down on the right side. McMurray makes the play and two outs. You know that's a really good pitch. He went change up away and got him to roll over and that's one of the things that that they really haven't been able to do during the first two ball games. I mean Tennessee has done a great job of, of not getting themselves out. Uh, they have they have especially Burke. Burke's gone from foul pole to foul pole uh, swinging the bat and they just Auburn's not been able to make the kind of pitch he just made there. Dylan Dryling comes to the plate. He's one of seven 300 hitters in this lineup. They've got Moore at 347, Burke at 404, Dryling hitting 354, Tears, who's on deck, is batting 412, Bargo at 357, Curley at 333, Chapman at 359. There are very few easy spots in this lineup offensively. <laughs> Lynn, you've got me nervous, man. As, as, a, <laughs> as, as a guy who pitched a lot, that, that's uh, those are numbers you like to stay away from. Dryling has started 28 of 29 games in which he's appeared, and he sends one out to right field. Ike Irish locates it, and it's a 1-2-3 inning. A good start for Will Cannon in his first start this year. Three up, three down. We move forward. Cooper Weiss leads it off out of Fort Myers, Florida. He's a graduate student. That's interesting. Both teams are, are very aware of the these guys. They're looking. They're hunting fastballs. Nobody wants to get ambushed on a first pitch fastball, so they're starting soft. And the 1-0 is lashed in the right center field. That's down for a base hit. A long single to the opposite side by Weiss. And he squared it up. Hitting it between the stitches, a good start for Weiss and the Tigers. Hey, Cooper Weiss has been a really good pickup out of the portal for Auburn. Uh, Miami of Ohio transfer in the portal, really, really steady shortstop, and has been a very productive offensive player. I, I think he's one of the, the better transfers in the country. That was his second hit of the series, and it brings on Ike Irish. Irish is three for seven in the first two games with a home run and two driven in. That's a strike in the upper part of the zone. You know, these two teams, they, they just have so much good left handed hitting. Uh, it's both sides. I mean, if you look at the, the guys that are sort of uh, providing the sock and the punch in the lineup, it's, it's coming from the left side. Weiss takes a moderate lead. He's an excellent base stealer, and now he retreats a little bit. Unsure of that move by Seacrest, but Weiss has stolen 24 bases. He's only been nabbed three times. He can be a lightning bolt on the base paths. Only a moderate lead at this point. He might stretch it as Seacrest comes to the stretch. And he's looked back at first base. 
There's always that cat and mouse game going on, isn't there? You know, and, and Auburn's running way more this year than in years past. And, and, you know, they're one of two, I think, D1 teams that have got 50 bags and 50 home runs. They've coached it up on the on the base running side. They've really they've really coached up base stealing. I, I honestly think when they went into this season, they didn't expect the home run potential, the home run power. They didn't expect the home run power, and so they worked a lot in the fall on sealing bags. Well, they show up in the spring, and they get this sort of unexpected uh, punch at the plate, and yet they they can also steal some bags. It's, well, they've it's pretty 56 impressive. 56 already this year. They only had 48 the entire season a year ago. Absolutely. Tennessee is well aware of the prowess by Weiss on the base paths. The outfield is very deep and straight away. In fact, the right fielder, Tears, is nearly scratching his back on the fence. You can hardly see him out there. And the pitch swing and a foul tip. You know, I think we're going to see outfielders on both teams playing back today. <laughs> There's a lot of sock in these lineups. Uh, right now, no wind. The flag in right center field is limp. The winner wins the series. Auburn won the first game. Tennessee came back and won the second game. And we have had no shortage of home runs in this series. Got a very veteran pitching coach over in the Tennessee dugout in Frank Anderson. So he's going to do all he can to control this running game. This is fouled off the other way. Number four, Tennessee. And Auburn. We thank you for joining us wherever you may be watching from all over the world. Maybe relaxing with friends in your living room out on your deck. Perhaps watching through your phone. Maybe from a sports bar or an airport waiting room. Wherever you may be, welcome to the broadcast. We are coming your way from beautiful Auburn, Alabama. And we hope you'll tell a buddy about the game. Steve Smith, Lynn Rollins with you. We are absolutely delighted you have chosen to spend some time with us. There's a line shot and a couple of bounces through the right time. Weiss will have to stop at second base. And two well-struck balls off Seacrest by Weiss and Irish. You know, Ike has been really, really consistent guy. And the left on left doesn't seem to bother him at all. Uh, I, I actually think his numbers against left-handed pitching are probably better than they are against rights. So now an RBI opportunity for Cooper McMurray. He's two for six in the series with a double at an RBI. And another left-handed hitter. Ike Irish is hitting 392 against left-handed pitching. That's remarkable. Yep. And the guy at the plate, Cooper McMurray, he's hitting 381. Which is better than his season's average of 369. You know, he and Irish lead the team with 11 home runs. That breaking ball does not bite. McMurray's been one of their more clutch offensive players. He's, he's got power all over this ballpark. You know, we've got that short wall in left field. So these left-handed hitters, it, it helps them as much as it does the rights. Well, it is short, but it's also very high. Yeah. Reminiscent of the monster at Fenway Park in Boston. And I love the fact that this ballpark is not symmetrical, that it is asymmetrical. A lot of nook and cranny angles out there, and it really adds to the character of the ball field. I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. This ball is driven a long way, way, way back. You can pucker up and kiss that baby goodbye. Right on cue, Cooper McMurray hits one on a rising line that banged against the building down in the right field corner. And Auburn has come out to a 3 nothing lead on singles by Weiss and Irish and a three-run swing by McMurray.
you know, starting a game like this for Auburn really can't help uh, put yesterday behind them really very, very quickly. The top of the first was as clean as it could get. And then to come out and, and really take three quality at bats to start this inning. And really, they've still got an inning to work with. We got three runs on the board with nobody out. So this, you know, this they've got a, a, another full inning here to go. For Cooper McMurray, he now has a team leading 12 home runs and 44, 45, and 46 RBI on that swing. That's one behind Ike Irish for the team lead. Three solidly hit balls, one by Weiss, one by Irish, and the coup de gras by McMurray. Chris Stanfield is waiting at the plate. We're going to have a conference as Auburn has come out and banged the baseball in the first inning. I don't. Stanfield out of Tallahassee, Florida. It's almost like he's leading off as the cleanup hitter because the first three hitters have singled, singled, and homered. And I suspect that Chris has probably done more leading off in his career than he has hitting in the middle of the lineup. He's a very, very talented player. His numbers don't reflect it yet, but uh, he's a very talented player. Stanfield has had three at-bats in the series with one base hit. And this is his second start in this three game series against Tennessee. He swings through it and can't find it. That one tied him up. And of course strikeouts have been very frequent for Xander Sechrist throughout his career. Here's Mason Mainers the left fielder for Auburn with one out three in. On the drive over the right field wall by Cooper McMurray. Mason's another one of these left-handers that is not affected by left-handed pitching. Uh, he's hitting 370-ish or so, uh, 371 against lefts to this point in the season. And again, you compare that to his 337 average, which may improve if he is not thrown out at first. He is by the shortstop, Curley. Dean Curley making a good play moving to his left. Dean Curley is a tremendous looking freshman. Uh, Southern California kid found his way to Knoxville. Uh, Tennessee's got one one injury this weekend. It's really shifted their lineup. Billy Amick, who's a transfer from Clemson, is out uh, with some health issues. And so they've had to juggle the left side of that infield a little bit. Here's the DH, Gavin Miller. And his first pitch swinging, he pops it up into foul territory, and that is out of the reach of the catcher, Cal Stark. One of the other things that I really enjoy about this ballpark, Steve, is the fact that there's not an extraordinary amount of room in foul ground, which means that all of these chair back seats and their wonderful seats are tremendous sight lines. You're very close to the action here. This is really one of the, the grand places to come watch college baseball in all the country. It has an atmosphere of its own. Auburn fans are great. They know the game. They also appreciate good opposing team play. But the sight lines and the distance from the field are very advantageous to the folks in the fans. It's a little bit low. And Lynn, they are doing so much to, to add to it. Uh, added outfield seating, got construction down the right field line, set a, an attendance record uh, a couple of Sundays ago that's probably going to get broken over the course of this weekend. It's, broke it yesterday so it's really uh, the uh, the fans have showed up and, and and honestly you know they I think they understand right now that a two and nine start in the SEC is not completely reflective of the caliber of play it's it's been a lot of close ball games and this ball is driven on a line to left field and tracked down by Dryling. he was able to recognize that coming off the bat four very well hit ball and here is Kavaris Tears to be followed by Dalton Bargo and Hunter Inslee. For Tears, it's been quite the improvement, wouldn't you say? Last year he hit 304 with only 56 at bats. How about this year? He's batting 412 with nine home runs. That's four times as many as he had last year. 
and he's more than doubled up his RBI total. This is a guy who has come alive in 2024. You know, <laughs> there's a saying in baseball that players all have a right to get better. Mm -hmm. But I like it, that. It, it's it, sometimes we're not patient enough with them as coaches to give them that, and, and a lot of times, they, especially in today's world, they jump in the portal and take off. That's elevated from Will Cannon. I think I would have liked to have played for you because I could have used two or three years of nurturing. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's a lot of other guys that would agree with you, but in other words, please, coach, don't cut me this year. Well, well patience is such a is such an important thing that, but you know what you know what hinders patience? What's that? Pressure. Yeah, yeah, good and, point. And so you're always playing against expectations, and sometimes if you don't, if you don't meet or exceed them right off the bat, uh, you run out of patience. Well, you take a look inside that uh, dugout, and Tony Vitello is. Uh, Certainly been one of the best coaches in the SEC, a two time national coach of the year. They came back to back in 21 and 22. And he has resurrected the Tennessee program. They're one of the feared teams in the league and a national player under his leadership. Tony got his start at the University of Missouri as a player and, and stayed on there. Uh, I think his first move from there was to TCU. TCU to Arkansas, Arkansas to Tennessee. This is his first head coaching job. How'd you like to cut your teeth as a head coach in the SEC? We're watching two guys today in Butch Thompson and, and Tony Vitello who have both done that. Uh, Butch had had 20 years or so in the league. Tony, not quite that much. But both having to, having to, to learn their way along at, at, at what I think is the major league version of Division I baseball. Well said. So I've got an early trivia question for you Steve as we start the Major League Baseball season a few days ago. How many former SEC players were on opening day rosters. We'll see answer that in a moment. This ball is banged a long way at one hops the wall. Bargo is held to a single on a quick return to the infield by Ike Irish. But tears reading that one from first base all the way has no trouble getting to third. And how often do you see a single off the warning track. That's what we just had from Bargo as he just ripped it into the right field corner. You know Ike Irish hadn't played a lot of the outfield. Uh, you know they're, they're giving him a break today from behind the plate and he's far the most out of the SEC than any other conference on opening day rosters in Major League Baseball. You know. I don't know that that would have been true 20 years ago. You know, when you when you think about the states in the country that really provide, you know, major league players, you're talking about California, clearly, uh, Texas, clearly. Then maybe you get to Florida, uh, and then I would say probably Georgia. Uh, but. I, I, I will say that the SEC has become a nationwide recruit recruiter. So this is no longer a regional conference in terms of college baseball. You know, and probably Tennessee is is as good an example of that as any. I'll I'll get to that in just a minute. Meanwhile, Auburn is trying to cast ice on a would-be rally. And Will Cannon, although supported by three runs in the bottom of the first finds himself in trouble here in the second with a walk and a single by Bargo and Hunter Inslee at the plate. One ball two strikes the peg goes to first base. So Lynn here's what I'm talking about if I go down through the lineup today with Tennessee and just talk about states where they're from New York California Kansas Tennessee Nebraska Tennessee California Colorado and Tennessee. That is that, that is a pretty broad recruiting base. But as you mentioned earlier SEC baseball is a national brand. Absolutely. And, and that the network probably is you know the SEC network is you know I, I would think has has got to be one of the major reasons for that. Inslee at the plate trying to increase his 15 RBI total this year hitting 287. 
He's been a part-time starter, and he is hit by a pitch, and the bases are loaded with nobody out. So a walk, a driving single by Bargo off the warning track in right field, and Cannon was working well ahead in the count, and then plunks Inslee. And the water is starting to boil around Will Cannon after he was supported by three runs in the first. You know, you just can't blink. Uh, when you, you get through the first three and you just you can't blink. And what I mean by that is you just can't let up. And and I, I know Will knows that and I'm not suggesting that he has. But, you know, when you crack the door, uh, this this Tennessee lineup can really, really go after you. It is one of the most powerful lineups in the country. And now it is Dean Curley at the plate. He's had a very good series. He's four for eight. Two of those hits have been doubles. He's looking for his first run batted in of the weekend. True freshman playing shortstop in the SEC. Cannon to the plate. That's downstairs. And you know, that's part of the league that's involved as well. It was a rarity a couple of decades or more ago for a first-year player to come in and have an impact. But all over the league, there are freshmen in the everyday lineup who are among the better players in the in the, uh, in the SEC. It's, it's not unusual anymore. Well, if you're a freshman in this era of college baseball and you're starting, particularly in this league, you are talented because the portal has allowed teams to go out and get veteran players right off the bat. And it, it, it has raised the caliber of play on the field to its highest level. Here's the 2-0 pitch. And that is off the mark, and Will Cannon is digging himself a hole right now. He walked tears to open the inning. That's never a good thing. Bargo banged a base hit to right. He was ahead in the count to Inslee, but then plunked him. And now it's 3-0. With pressure mounting, Curley at the plate. He'll probably take at least one. And there's a miss. It's a four-pitch base on balls. And the second walk in the inning. You know, if he was filling up the strike zone a little bit better, he might would have got that call. But it's a uh, it's a tough it's a tough strike to to give you when you've been kind of all over the place. He really, really needs a ground ball in here somewhere. He needs somebody to pick him up on the defensive side. Right now, if Auburn were to escape with only one run additionally scoring, it would be considered a win. But Tennessee is on the cusp of a huge inning here with the bases loaded, one run in already, and nobody out. And Reese Chapman at the plate. Chapman is looking for his first base hit in the series. He's had one start. He has appeared in both previous games. He's 0 for 5 at the plate. Cannon needs another strike. And he gets it. You know, Chapman goes up there swinging. The guy in front of him walks on four pitches, and he goes up there swinging first pitch. Uh, you know, it's how much the game has changed. That, you know, traditionally, you would have been an automatic take right there, but he was he was hunting a fastball. This will be lifted out of play. So I mentioned that the SEC has 88 former players on Major League Baseball opening day rosters. Auburn has three. Ground ball might produce a double play and get Auburn out of the inning. Really, really good change. Uh, kind of a power change. Uh, Will didn't throw anything soft, and that ball, that ball really dove at the end. Tennessee also has three former players in the major leagues. Two teams in the SEC led the way with 11. 
you know, Steve, just to follow up this thought a little bit, I've been of the contention for years now that on every roster in 2024, and has been the case in previous years, there is a future major leaguer. I'm not going to claim I know who it is, and I'm not going to claim that they're going to be Hall of Famers, but I think in every roster, on every roster, this ball is driven way, 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 way back, and it is gone! A four-run swing! And just like that, the Tennessee Volunteers have erased a 3-0 deficit early and have scored five in the inning. How about that? Cal Stark's first base hit in this series is his third home run of the year, and his RBI total has gone from six to ten. You know, that was a fat pitch, and he did something with it. I was going to say prior to the at bat that this was the one guy in the lineup that you can get out. Uh, he's hitting under 200 or so coming into the series, but you know that just goes to show you when they've got a bat in their hand, they're dangerous. He left the breaking ball up, uh, and Cal, you know, got all of it. That's a that's a that's a real backbreaker right there early in the ball game. It really is, especially after Auburn stung the baseball in the bottom of the first and scored three runs. But Cal Stark has turned things around in a hurry. You know, this is that time where you start asking the question, how much pressure is too much? How much adversity is too much? This is a, this is a ton of adversity for, for Auburn to be facing right now. That's the third hit of the series by Stark. And his first runs batted in. And I, I think the way that, that the way the rest of this game plays out will be the answer to that question. How much adversity is too much? And can Auburn, if necessary, duplicate the relief pitching that it enjoyed in the first game, which was extraordinary, one of the best relief performances across the league this year? The one two pitch downstairs. But getting back to my theory, which was so rudely interrupted by the Grand Slam home run, by the way, um, would you agree, Steve, that on every roster this year, there is a future major leaguer. Absolutely. At some I, point. I, yeah, I don't think that's a theory. I, I think that's. Uh, this th ball is tagged way, way back, and it is gone. A home run off the light standard. Back to back home runs for these Tennessee Volunteers, and they are so powerful. And both of these balls driven over the wall, the grand slam by Stark, and then Christian Moore follows with a home run to right center field. And here come the Volunteers. That is his sixth hit of the series, his third home run in the series, and his ninth RBI. And it has come apart in the second for Auburn. Christian Moore's having a heck of a weekend. Blake Burke, who's been red hot. And Burke is first pitch swinging and drives it deep to right field. It is Irish circling, now moving to his right, and he's got it a few feet in front of the warning track. Again, there's, there's no waiting in them. They're up there looking to ambush the first pitch that's in the strike zone. Uh, Burke is just a guy that can hit the ball to any place in the park and, and really has hit everything anybody's thrown out of the park. He just missed that ball. Here is Dylan Dryling. He's the ninth volunteer to bat in the inning. He flied to right field last time. Carlson misses on a close pitch. <laughs> so why did he need to swing at that? Because he, he couldn't. <laughs> that ball is down the way. He couldn't get to it. You throw something in the strike zone, the guy's going to be swinging. A 351 average. And the pitch, an overhand curve, ripped into right field. Dryling makes the turn at first base. Dryling is going to dig for second, and Dryling will make it. He did not need the slide. And the powerful output by Tennessee continues in this inning. Two home runs 
including a grand slam and a two-out double by Dryling. So I'm going to tell you a thought that's going through an Auburn dugout right now. It's going to be, are we tipping pitches? That was a 1-0 breaking ball. All right, he started off with a fastball that missed, and he's pitching backwards, so he doesn't he doesn't give him a 1-0 fastball. He gives him a 1-0 breaking ball, but he hit it like he knew it was coming. And so, when an offense is is producing like they are, you do start to wonder about, are we tipping pitches? Well, how about Dryling in this series? He's had three hits. They've all been extra base hits. His first two were homers, and he follows that with a double. So he's had three hits in the series. He's three, four, nine now, and all three have been extra base hits. That's a pretty good slugging percentage, isn't it? Two homers and a double. Yeah. And a wild pitch moves Dryling to third base. My, what a reversal we've had after an output by Auburn of stinging the baseball in the first inning, scoring three times, but in a variety of ways, surrendering six in the second. And Tears started it all when he walked to open the inning a long time ago. He's the tenth batter to come to the plate for the Volunteers. Three balls and no strikes. Parker Carlson has replaced Will Cannon. And that's a pitch for a strike. So there you go, 3-0 breaking ball. Would have been unheard of. Yeah. Tears is hitting over 400 this year. And that is off the mark. He has walked twice in the inning, has Cabarrus tears. It would, it would be rare in the game, but sometimes a walk's not a bad thing. And I think if, if you can find a way to slow Tennessee down, and honestly slowing them down right now is keeping the ball in the ballpark. They score, and all their runs are coming on the home runs. Well, they hit six yesterday. They've already erupted for two homers in the second inning. That's a good mitt popper for a strike. Bargo batting a whopping 368. He's driven in 22. He had a base hit earlier in the inning and scored. That's hit sharply to the left side. Off the glove of Caden Green. It rolls out into right field. And the throw to third is not in time on the double tag. It looked like Caden Green was going to be able to make that play going to his left. And the ball caromed off the webbing of his glove. It was a breaking pitch. Hit pretty well. Alabama but. is challenging the ruling of safe at third base. <laughs> well, we, we heard the boo because the umpire has just said Alabama is challenging the rule of safe at third base. <laughs> I, 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 I think he's thinking, what did I say and why did I say it? That's but classic <laughs> right there. That's a classic. That, that, that's not going to earn you any points. In the, in the ballpark. I mean, no. you know, you're already walking on thin ice as an umpire, right? And then you you misidentify. You not only misidentify Auburn, you misidentify Auburn with the name that is synonymous with hate here. <laughs> and uh, that's a classic. Uh, the only good news about it, he did it on Sunday. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> he can get out of town pretty quick. Oh, my goodness. Did he slide past the bag? This is what having struggles on the mound. You just, you just really need that play. So it continues the inning. And this has been a seven spot in the second inning for Tennessee after yielding three. Hunter Inslee at the plate from Huntington, Tennessee. 
And a play for Stanfield in center field. He waits for it to come out of the heavens. And the inning is finally over. But a big. And a three run homer by Cooper McMurray as the first three Tigers stung the baseball. Singles by Weiss and Irish. And then McMurray unleashed one over the right field wall. After that. Xander Sechrist retired three in a row and now it's Carter Wright Eric Guevara and uh, Caden Green the bottom third of the order. <laughs> Another well hit ball Inslee is back and he's got it in front of the warning track. Wright gave it a ride, but could not beat Hunter in, uh, easily in center field. So Inslee was able to get to that. And now it brings up Eric Guevara. And he's quite the story, having recovered from ACL injury in record time. Yeah, it, it, it really remarkable. Uh, blew out the knee back in the fall doing rundown stuff had complete ACL repair and it's just you know he's trying to hit his way into a, a routine in the middle of SEC play which is obviously not an easy thing to do. This is the fourth game in which he's appeared and his third start he's 0 for 7 on the year. But Steve to recover that swiftly from that ACL injury it's just 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 remarkable. He, he tore it on October 5th. He had surgery six days later. He was cleared for baseball activities in January, which is remarkable. He made his Auburn debut on the 26th of last month and his first career start on the third of this month. I mean, people rarely, rarely come back from that kind of surgery that quickly. No, it's a, obviously a credit to Eric, but all the support staff around him, uh, they had to really work hard and, and honestly you don't know how you can speed up really speed up the healing process but they they've done a great job with it to get him ready to play tears moves to his left and makes the play near the foul line in fair territory and two fly ball outs quickly result in a pair of outs here in the second inning this brings on Caden Green the second baseman and the thing about that injury it was a non contact injury they were in a rundown drill and as he twisted to reverse direction the knee blew out. You know you hear stuff like that you know in other sports and it's usually on turf. Mm -hmm. uh, you know this is obviously not on turf and just a kind of a freakish thing. Inslee is back and three pretty well hit balls in that inning but nothing to show for it is. Now of course Auburn's relief pitching was just off the chart good in seven plus innings of relief in the first game shutting down Tennessee to preserve the victory. Then Tennessee hit six homers yesterday and they're away with two today. Dean Curley out of Laverne California smacks a sinking liner and it is misplayed by Mainers. It looked like he might catch it but it got beyond him and rolls to the wall and Dean Curley pulls up at second base. I thought that ball was going to be down initially for a base hit and then Mainers made up ground on it but he could not complete the catch. You know I think he had top spin on that and it's a tough ball to play but obviously Mason's dejected but he, he knows he should have made the play. And on a game like this today, you just, gosh, you just got to make the plays. You that know? ball sunk, and 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 really, I don't think he ever touched it with his glove. Do you? I, I don't think so. It's top spinning. I mean, it's a tough play. It's it, it looks it doesn't look tough from up here, but it's a it's a pretty tough play. So Curly is at second base, and Chapman at the plate. Reese struck out in the second. I don't know how they'll score that but I think they're still debating regardless of how they score it regardless of how they score it he's he's he knows he wish he would he could have made the play. Uh, 
You know, one of the things that's crazy when you're when you're working with outfielders and you're hitting the ball, whether you're hitting them off a fungo or you're or you're shooting it out of a machine, it's hard to replicate down uh, top spin. Right. You know, uh, most guys in the infield with a fungo, you know, the really good fungo guys we all like to watch, they hit everything with backspin. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of balls hitting the ball game that don't have backspin, and that was one of them. He kind of got over the top of it at the plate, had top spin out there, and it made for a very difficult play. It has been ruled a double, and Steve, you could see it breaking like a 12-6 curveball. That's exactly right. That's a great description of it. That's exactly what it would be like. The pitch. And it's one in which you don't know is coming. It's one thing if you know a 12-6 is coming, you can you can anticipate a little bit, but it would still be tough to catch. So Curley is in scoring position with nobody out. Chapman at the plate. One ball, two strikes. Auburn is trying to hold down this powerful Tennessee team to give its lineup a chance. Trailing by four here early. The pitch. Just a little bit off the mark. You it know is an absolutely great day to be at the ballpark or to be on the field playing. A Chamber of Commerce Day in Auburn, Alabama. The sky is the color of a cornflower right now. The pitch at 2 2. Time is called. You got a clock violation. Sure do. So pushes through to that's pretty big. So that 22nd clock had elapsed. Now it's reset and rolling. Three balls, two strikes. Carlson brings it. And there is ball four. So that pitch clock violation moved the count to three to three and two. And then Chapman draws the base on balls. And this brings on Cal Stark, who crashed one last time with the bases loaded. You know, I bet you there's a lot of times that, that Tony would sacrifice bunt right here. But I don't think he's going to do it today. Well, what do I know? We'll see if he holds the bunt on. And I, I would tell you that, that Auburn would take it out right here in a heartbeat. Well, Stark is only a 229 hitter before that grand slam and had only six runs driven in. Now, he has not been an everyday player. This is his 13th start, but he's made the most of it so far. And he hits another one high and deep. My goodness, the nine hole hitter has driven in seven. A grand slam home run in the second. A rising, towering deep drive over the left field wall with two teammates aboard here in the third. What a day for Cal Stark at the bottom of the order. Seven driven in on a pair of home runs. Now you wish you'd have got the butt down. Wow. Both home runs off breaking balls. Both of them is speeding his bat up. Uh, you know, everybody in the dugout right now second guessing that one. And the Volunteers have scored 10 in the first two innings. You know, I think I've got an explanation. It's the solar eclipse tomorrow. I mean, it's throwing the world out of whack. Well, I know I know there's half this ballpark would like to see that solar eclipse happen in the next 20 minutes. Uh, if we could get it all dark, maybe we could, you know, get something going. But this is really, this is a very, very good Tennessee offense uh, that is taking advantage of every mistake. Uh, that's that's coming their way and, and some that aren't even mistakes. They're swinging the bat really well. Christian Moore had a home run last time. He's backed away from the plate. He lined out to center field in the first and he hit one over the wall in the second. I was going to mention this a moment ago. This is not that I would ever suggest 
throwing out a batter or anything like that, but that is the first time I think that a hitter has been forced to move. And, you know, you got to make them a little bit uncomfortable. And right now, they've been comfortable at the plate for uh, quite a while, going back to yesterday. And somehow or another, you just got to figure out with the ammunition you have, how can you make them uncomfortable? Move the feet, move the eye level if possible within the rules of the game. And that'll put the runner at first base. It was a marvelous start for Auburn. So he is the second reliever and he drops one in for a strike on Blake Burke. Who's a 400 hitter but he's 0 for 2 so far. I mean he's got enough ammo and the and the split is the one pitch uh, that has got a chance to to be a special pitch going forward. This guy's got a lot of upside. He's got a he's got a chance to be a very very good one going down down the road. He's had three decisions. He won them all. Right now he's working with a seven run deficit. Burke has four hits in the first two games 0 for 2 today. One of those hits was a home run and another one was a double. It was a split right there and you can see Burke did all he could and he got a he got a piece of it he fouled it off. You know Auburn Auburn fans will when I say the word split they think of Casey Mize and there have been some comparisons uh, you know within the coaching staff uh, to Casey and and Cam in terms of that split. Now you're talking about a real compliment when you're talking about comparing him with Casey Mize. I, do, I am and I and I'm doing it with with some degree of measure. Uh, that's that's those are those are big shoes to fill but that that is kind of how they think about this kid he's touched 93 already tried to back door the breaking ball the pitch that's prolonged this at bat was Burke fouling off that split um, you know one of the things about the Tennessee hitters that's that's really astounding to me the number of home runs versus the number of strikeouts um, there's another one right there. But normally when you see a guy with a with you know approaching 20 home runs it's usually a guy that overswings he doesn't give in with two strikes and you're going to see a lot of strikeouts. That's just not the case here. You see uh, with Burke he's got he only has 19 strikeouts on the season and almost that many home runs. And if you look down the lineup there's other guys that are that are in that in that ballpark too. There's a lot of guys with relatively low strikeout numbers to the number of home runs they've got. If I'm not mistaken Condon holds the lead right now with 20 home runs. That's the best in the SEC. Yeah and, and Tennessee got to see him last week and the first pitch they threw him last week went out of the ballpark in Knoxville. George has got a very I think a very underrated team especially offensively. Here's a hot ground ball past the diving Caden Green a base hit for Burke. That's a good at bat for Burke. He saw a, a variety great. of pitches. He was able to stay alive and uh, eventually gets one off the barrel of the bat with that ground single into right field. And, and it's really not a bad job by Cam Tilly. He got a ground ball. Uh, I mean right now if you can get the ball keep the ball on the ground right now you've got a chance everything Tennessee's doing is 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 hitting the ball out of the park. Here's Dylan Dryling who has flied to right and doubled and scored. Tilly is listed at 6 1 201 pounds he looks a little bit bigger than that to me. Yeah I would have saw I would have said 6 3 ish. He's from Newburgh Indiana. But you know they don't stop the game right now and ask you how tall you are. No they don't. Right keeps that one playable. Oh 
on a day like this. Catching becomes a chore sometimes. The pitch. Upstairs. A double, a walk, a home run, a walk, and a single so far in the inning. Well, the inning continues with another base runner. And so after the double, the walk, and the second home run of the day by Stark, Moore and Burke have walked and singled, and now Dryling has walked, and the bases are loaded, still with nobody out. Time is called, and uh, Tilly will get a visit from his dugout. Steve Smith, Lynn Rollins with you. It was a promising start for Auburn, exploding tears. It does not get any easier with him at the plate. He's walked twice and scored uh, scored once. I bragged on the on the split when he went out there, and we hadn't seen too many of them. Two and zero. Oh. That pitch there would just sort of illustrate a pretty lack of confidence, pretty big lack of confidence. That one heated up a little bit, 92, and in a good spot. Auburn pitchers have walked five already, and they've hit a batter. So we had a mess right there. The catcher didn't know what was coming. He tried to get time out. Pitcher didn't step off. He threw a pitch that I think is right down the middle for a strike, and it doesn't get called because the catcher stood up. Now the 3 1. That gets a piece of the plate. And a mock cheer goes up. Three and two, bases loaded. Foul straight back this way. I would have had that had the net not been in that the way. That was right at us. I mean, I, I I reacted quickly. It had some top spin, but I read it. <laughs> I think we'd have both been ducking. Again, the three-two pitch with the bases bases full. Swing and a miss. That's what the doctor ordered for Auburn. All right, Lynn, I want you to pay special note to the location of this fastball. Got in on the hands, didn't it? That's a fastball in what I would call the four. It was an accident. That's not where he was trying to go with it, but that's where he was pitching. And I would say a long time ago after watching all that's going on here, that's where I'm throwing. I, I am I am trying to throw as many fastballs in that four as I can. Uh, they've hit everything else. And again, you, you're you're not going to always, you, you, very rarely, honestly, are you going to get the ball to where you're trying to go. But you got to start out with that intent, or you'll never get it there, or it'll be very rare, like we just saw. That was high and tight in the strike zone. And tears is the. First out of the inning. And, and the hitter doesn't know where you're trying to throw it. All the hitter knows is what got him out. And he, he you know, finally they got, they got, uh, who was that? It was Tears. They got Tears out on a fastball on his hands. He's going to take that memory to, his, to the plate the next time he goes up there. This is Bargo at the plate. He takes a strike. He's had a single. He has scored. He's also reached on an error. And right now, you know, Right now is when I'm going there. Let's check the one two pitch. High and away. Well, Bargo is hoping at the end of the season to get back to his hometown <laughs> because he lives in Omaha, Nebraska. I think he's he's by way of Missouri, I believe. 
think he spent a year at University of Missouri. And now the pitch. Swing and a miss. He took a big cut. And fouls it back into the mitt. How about that? Of right. Back to back strikeouts with the bases loaded. So this freshman is a pitch or two away from escaping. A big, big problem. But Hunter Ensley is waiting for him out of Huntington, Tennessee. He's a fourth year junior. And the pitch hit him. That hit him. And another run for Tennessee. And this is the second time in as many innings that Tennessee has batted around. So five walks and two hit batsmen from the Auburn pitching staff today. The 23, Dean Curley. And Dean Curley comes to the plate. It was Curley who started this inning with a double. Curley nine batters ago hit a top spin double to left field a liner that got down and he scored the first run of the inning there were three more to follow him. It's 11 nothing. Excuse me 11 three. Tennessee leading Auburn. The 1 1 pitch from Cam Tilly. That misses wide. Tilly has been in that 92, 93 mile an hour range. He's got plenty of stuff. He, the, the two breaking balls, uh, and when I say breaking ball, curve balls, he hit the guy. He hit, got a hit better with one. They started the next one. It kind of popped out, so he went slider. And then he's missed kind of big with those last two fastballs. You know, these pitches are all coming from the dugout, and, they, and, you know, they're trying to find something that he can execute right now. Well, he's got to find the strike zone with a 3 1 count, and the base is loaded. And that'll move the count full. Tennessee has enjoyed back to back very productive innings. A rare shake off by Tilly. Let's see what he goes with. Let's see what happens here in center field. Stanfield twisted one way, twisted the other, and finally was able to locate it and make the play. A four run. Giving them middle relief stuff. He's a kind of a go to guy. Well, it's amazing that he has six decisions all out of the bullpen. Yeah. He's five and one. This is his 10th appearance. He does not have a start. He's worked 34 and a third innings, allowed 32 hits. He has walked 11 and struck out 29 with a 3.15 ERA, but. Six decisions out of the bullpen. That's a lot. In fact, he's the uh, he's the winningest pitcher for Tennessee. Cooper Weiss gets a much needed base hit as he wraps it through the left side. That one was banged between Bargo and Curley. So Weiss at the top of the order is two for two. He's having a good day. And here's Ike Irish who followed Weiss's base hit with one of his own back in the first. Irish with 11 home runs. 45 hits on the year, batting 372. You know, Steve, no player, no matter how good they are, is slump proof at the plate. But Irish's bad spots offensively have been very rare and very shallow. He has been remarkably consistent. 
with a high average and power and RBI totals and uh, truly one of the steadiest and most productive hitters in the league. And that goes back to last year yep. and, and through the what we bought the first half of this year. I, I think he's a really special bat and I think one of the one of the early decisions that had to be made that Butch and those guys had to make is, is were they going to put him behind the plate. He caught very little last year. Uh, you know he was he was kind of the backup to Nate LaRue who was really tremendous defensively. Let's look at Ike Irish as opposed to the rest of the league. He's third in the league in batting, sixth in on base percentage. He's 19th in hits, uh, excuse me, second in hits. This is in the SEC. 16 driven in in league play. I mean, this is one of the premier hitters across the course of the league, but not that time. But Ike Irish, truly one of the steadiest and most productive offensive players in the league. Here's Cooper McMurray. He had a three run home run last time as he ripped it over the right field wall and it got out of here quickly. He's first pitch swinging and pulls it foul. That home run by McMurray gave him the team lead by one over Irish. McMurray now with 12 home runs and 46 driven in. That's second on the club behind Irish's 47. That's a pretty good load back to back offensively in the lineup, isn't it? Irish and McMurray. Yeah. And you could throw Weiss in there too as the leadoff hitter. You know, they've been, you know, Gabe Gross has been splitting these guys up. You know, right, left, right, left uh, for most of the year, but I think that uh, this ball is carrying very, very deep and circling at the last minute is Ensley. That's a well done play by Ensley as he tracked it down. He had to make a uh, right turn late in the flight of this ball and was able to track it down near the warning track. Center fielder number three, Chris. We've talked about offense all weekend, but this is a tremendous defensive play. It really is. He made it look very, very easy out there. If you wanted to put a, a letter on that route, it was an L. <laughs> well, you mentioned earlier this not wind is not a factor today. Uh, and this park is is not. I don't think it's known as being a, an exceptional hitter's park. It, it is from the standpoint of the lack of foul territory that you brought up earlier. Uh, I mean, there's no there's no easy outs in foul territory. There's just not much of it. Uh, but it's not like it's extremely tight. You still got to, you know, the home runs here are fair. And and I don't. They, I think most of the ones that we've seen hit over the last couple of days, they would have been out of any park. Well, you've also got uh, some sizable buildings beyond the wall, virtually from foul pole to foul pole. And uh, that can bring you in right now. Thank you for spending some time with us. Your club was patient and started recognizing pitches in the second inning. It's been nothing that uh, hasn't happened before in this series. This offense has been special. Yeah, I mean, you want to kind of come out of the gates there on a Sunday, one-to-one -one game in the SEC, you know, having to have a big first inning. But just because you do, it doesn't guarantee guarantee success later uh, and I think it's important we go quick three up three down and our guys didn't really waver and there was good communication in the dugout so uh, able to bounce back and score runs the next inning. Tony what was the decision to uh, lift Xander Christ a Christ a, a, a Seacrest about obviously uh, he was working with a big lead and you've got great pitching behind him. Yeah I mean we've kind of done a variation with him as far as um, the length that he's thrown for us and we just kind of went with the fact that Beam helped us out so much yesterday with his gutsy effort uh, and saved our bullpen and Combs did a great job on Friday too so when you play these series Everything kind of affects everything, and, and we feel like we've got a bunch of guys down there that can help us equally to Xander. And, of course, he did a good job for us in that second inning, kind of right in the ship a little bit. Tony, what do you think about the day Cal Stark has had? 
you know, he's fun to watch. You know, he's a typical Texas kid. Um, that's where he was born and then moves to Knoxville and then goes to junior college down there. So he, he's a competitive kid and has a lot of pride in what he does. And he, even when he's not having the day that he is offensively, he's a huge boost to us. Even when he's not playing, he's a huge boost to us. Um, he helped that turnaround we had last year big time. That's when we started playing better when he was back behind the plate. Thanks for your time, Tony. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. Have a good one. So far, Tennessee is having a good one. And we talked about Stark. He'll be in the on-deck circle. Joseph Gonzalez is pitching now for Auburn. And golly, you just hope he can get healthy and, and get back to the form he was prior to his shoulder surgery. This was one of the very best in the SEC a couple of seasons ago, and it's been it's been tough sledding since then because of those injuries and just a lot of uncertainty around Joseph Gonzalez. But when he is right, he has been lights out, a great sinker, a great slider, exceptional control, and just so difficult to time up. That pitch is left over the middle of the plate and a solid single to right. So our best to Joseph Gonzalez, who's just been battling that nagging shoulder problem, and that's a tricky surgery, and it's a tricky return, and just a lot of things uh, going on in there. You know, you brought up earlier the 50-year anniversary of, of Tommy John. And that, that surgery is very has become very predictable. Shoulder surgeries are not near as predictable. You're right. And, you know, Joseph, is, his velo's climbing. Uh, you know, from his first outings early in the year, the velo is climbing. Let's see if Wright has a play. He does not. That's up on the net. This is uh, Cal Stark at the plate. A grand slam home run and a three run home run from the nine hole hitter. But you're going back, Joseph is a, I mean, he was a tremendous guy for Team USA. He, he's not just a, an SEC guy, this guy's one of the best guys in the country. And, you know, the beginning of last year, he just had to be shut down, and it, it, it tried a lot of rehab with him, finally did the, did the scope. And, you know, this has been a work in progress to get him back on the mound and get him strong again. The velo's coming. Uh, but, again, boy, you try to do all this when the hitters are on top of their game. Uh, there's no spring training here for you to work out the kinks. Here's the 0-2 pitch to Stark from Joseph Gonzalez. And this may be playable in foul ground. Nope, it's going to be about six rows up into the bleachers. Gonzalez two years ago was something very, very special. And that sinker he had, along with the pinpoint placement of the slider, was just exceptional, and it didn't matter if you knew it was coming. No, he's, he's never been a huge strikeout guy. He's been a contact guy, but it was all on the ground. Which, as I mentioned earlier, th that's what's needed today. I mean, you got to do something to, to keep the ball there. Tennessee is one of those teams that doesn't mind flying out. They're, they're going to hit the ball in the air a lot, but if you can Kind of take them out of their game just a little bit to get them to get the ball on the ground. Again, the 0-2 pitch. Ripped into left field. This ball is going to carry high off the wall. What a day by Cal Stark. He's on his way to second base. He'll make it with a double as he shoves Chapman to third. My goodness. Can anybody get Cal Stark out today? He has a grand slam home run, a three run home run, and a double. I mean, that's more bags than Kroger's. <laughs> 10 total bases already for Stark. Three for three at the bottom of the order. One can only imagine his Instagram after today. Wow. Mr. Cal Stark has been the story of the day at the bottom of the order. Here's Christian Moore. And on deck, a guy with a 22-game hitting streak, Blake Burke. Wow. I'm just astonished at what Stark has done.
There's your sinker. That's the, that's the pitch that he, he would like to be able to execute over and over again. Uh, 88 was sink. Two years ago, he was indeed a difference maker. And not every once in a while, but every time he took the mound. You know, we got more velo on that. He got that out at 91, but it's way off the mark. Uh, again, he's just trying to find some rhythm so he can execute pitch, you know, multiple pitches. Christian Moore is a New Yorker out of Brooklyn. There you go. He has lined out, homered, and walked. You know, when you get 13 home runs out of your leadoff guy, that's uh, kind of indicative of what's to come after the number one hitter. <laughs> You're exactly right. We think could two good sinkers here in this at bat. Good job of fouling that pitch off. I mean, that ball's crowding him pretty good. If you've got a if you've got a plus slider right now, it probably doesn't even need to be in the strike zone. It's just go go strike the ball with it. Start it on a strike line and let leave the leave the strike zone. The one two pitch, swing and a miss, and there's the first out of the inning. Just like that. Well, it comes at a good time. Chapman at third, Stark at second. And that's the first out of the inning. This brings on Blake Burke. Now, Blake Burke has a base hit today that moves his hitting streak to 22 games. That's the fourth longest in Tennessee baseball history. The record is held by Condridge Holloway back in 1975, a long time ago. And the record is 27 games in a row with that hitting streak to lead Tennessee all time. So Burke is five short of that. You know, Connors Hallway is a quarterback. Yeah. 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 See, I know that. You did know that. I grew up in Mississippi. I knew I knew all this stuff. The pitch way wide. You know what we just saw out of, jo out of Joseph uh, against Christian Moore was what he's capable of. Hard sinkers in, slider away. Hard sinkers in, slider away. That, it's just repeating it. Can he get a feel for it and repeat it? <laughs> Fastball in off the plate right there. Nothing Burke could do to that except hit it foul. This game started in promising fashion for Auburn, scoring three in the bottom of the first inning. But since then, it's been all volunteers. Seven in the second, four in the third. And a chance to get one here, and that bounces through on the left side. One volunteer scores. Here comes the second one, a two-run single by Blake Burke. So he's two for four. He's trying to go in with a fastball again. It, it got up to his arm side, and Burke just did a nice job with it. I mean, just doesn't do too much, just puts the ball on the ground to that side. That's just such a good piece of hitting. Steve, when you're up four times in four innings, you know things are going well offensively. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Against four different pitchers. Dryling has doubled and walked and flied to right. Dylan out of Hayes, Kansas. Twelve home runs for this young man. They have very balanced home run totals. They've got 12 from Moore. This is before today's game. 11 from Burke, 12 from Dryling. Nine from Tears, six from Margo, eight from Curly. Well, well, Burke is the career home run leader at Tennessee now. Yeah. And Moore's only about three behind him. I mean, they, he's going to have to. Whoever the career home run leader is is going to is going to be whoever leads this year's team in home runs. <laughs> Dryling scored a run in the second inning following his double. 
This may be trouble, a long run by the left fielder, but he's there in fair ground, a step short of the foul line. That was Mason Mainers. Let's go ahead and look at the uh, Tennessee career home run leaders, punctuated by Blake Burke at the top with 41 and coming in this series. And uh, Christian Moore just a couple behind. You wonder if those two guys, if they even know about that. I don't know. Good I mean, question. I mean, if they even, I mean, that's a that's a pretty good race right there within a club. The throw from short to first is in time. Wise to McMurray, and a couple of more runs for Tennessee. It's now 13 to three. Oh, it has not. You know, pardon this pun and this stretch a little bit, but Knox, K-N-O-X, Bill, has turned into K-N-O-C-K-S, Bill. <laughs> right? At least this weekend. I will leave you alone on that one. I figured you were that kind of partner. <laughs> but it's been K-N-O-C-K-S, Bill, for Tennessee this weekend. You know, Knox usually stay in the yard. Usually, yeah. you, you know, a ball leaves the yard. You don't say you, you got another knock, you know. I told you it was a bit of a stretch. Yeah. Mainers tried to get that one by in fair territory, but he can't do it. Mason grounded out to short back in the first. Give me another Diet Coke and I'll do better. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the, the whole 10 run rule thing. Obviously, on a day like today, when you're sitting here 13 to 3 in the bottom of the fourth, I mean, how do you come back in a game like this? Uh, how, can you how can you figure a way out to, to make it a game? Because you really only got. You don't, this is, this is, at this point, doesn't look like a nine in the game. This looks like a potential seven in the game. Mainer's waiting, fouls it straight back this way. And, there, and there's nobody, there's nobody in that third base dugout that wants to wave a white flag yet. Oh, and no. They're, they're, they're trying to figure out a way, how can we get this thing going? Obviously, they're going to have to do some special things. You know, you were talking about the uh, 10 run rule application. Well, that Diet Coke has just arrived, so I feel like this information I'm about to impart is uh, chemically enhanced a little bit. But Kentucky is 2-0 in 10 run games. Vanderbilt is 2-0. Mississippi State and Florida are 1-0. Tennessee has been involved in four games that have been shortened by the run rule. They are 3-1. and They have a chance to go to 4-1 and here. Georgia is 1-1 and and then bringing up the rear. Auburn 0-2, Ole Miss 0-3, LSU 0-3. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, to me, it's 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 just indicative of this league and the game. I mean, you you can run rule somebody on one day and get beat the next. Uh, baseball is just not like any other sport. It's it's so predicated a lot by what's on the mound, and on any given day. You know, that guy can can be special and, and do the job for you. We saw that here on Friday. Uh, There's Gavin Miller, the DH. He has lined out to left. He's from Oakdale, Pennsylvania. So, Steve, what's your mindset on, uh, what's your inclination on, I'm going to ask you whether the most 10-run rule games have been applied in game one, game two, or game three? Well, since I did the research on that, I, I know the answer to that. Uh, You're not supposed to admit. Well, it's all right. I was I curious. I mean, that's full disclosure. That's too much. Well, it's game three. Uh, 
And I'll tell you what, what my interest was in looking that up. For, for one thing, the 10 run rule is the first year that the SEC's had it in all three games. Uh, most leagues have had it in game three just because, you know, teams travel are purposes. travel. Yeah. Travel purposes and honestly, competitive equity purposes. When you shorten a game on Friday and Saturday, uh, it affects other. I mean, it affects your pitching staff. You 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 haven't been forced to throw guys, and so you have more depth tomorrow. Well, somebody across the, on the other side of the league, uh, they need you to play. They need you to throw everybody. But the coaches in the league, they voted unanimously to incorporate the ten run rule in all three games, and I think their biggest motivation was so much of the game is being evaluated now by length mm -hmm. and average length times of games are getting measured backhand play by the shortstop comes up firing uh. out at first my goodness Dean Curley made a heck of a pickup and throw he bounced it to Blake Burke and he dug it beautifully and that is a major league quality play on both ends Yeah, you know, it's, it's as great a play as it was for Tennessee it's in a game like this just a really tough one to swallow for Auburn they needed base runners and he made a big time backhand play and throw to to get uh, who was that Miller. Yeah, yeah. Gavin Miller at first base. Well, put a star by that one in your scorebook because that's a heck of a play by Curley. And then a tremendous dig on a low throw by Burke. This pitch is driven deep. It bounces off the warning track. Auburn's going to add to its three run total. A smash by Carter Wright. And he really belted that one. And it makes that play by Curley even bigger. Uh, I mean, again, we're, we're still a long way from being close, but you're trying to get runners on to get a timely double just like that. And they got that, but it probably saved him a run. He may could have easily scored for first on that. I think you're right. Right now, Auburn's task is to just extend the game, not get into that 10-run rule That's right. possibility. Are we going to see another one? We are. Oh, wow. We are. Bargo at third, but a sensational pickup by Burke at first base. You cannot do it any better than that. We have seen two 24 karat goal defensive plays on the infield in this inning. It's a lot of confidence uh, playing the game with a lot of confidence. I mentioned earlier they're you know they're out. Uh, they're missing a player on the left side of the field uh, due to injury Billy Amick and so you know that's that's not what we normally or what Tennessee fans are normally expecting to see on the left side of the infield. A tremendous play by Bargo after the tremendous play by his colleague Curley at shortstop. And man, that left side of the infield has been impenetrable here in this inning. The pitch to Green. And it's 2-0. and oh. You know, Nate Snead's probably not used to pitching with eight and nine run leads, 10 run leads. So maybe. Oh. Well, Auburn needs base runners. Yep. Not necessarily by bruise, but uh, this is the way you climb back because it is very difficult to come from 10 or 11 runs down strictly via the base hit. It's absolutely right. But when you get a couple of charitable opportunities with walks or hit batters it really increases the odds proportionally and again it, it just highlights again the, the the importance of those two big time defensive plays at shortstop and third oh, indeed. base that that very legitimately could have and probably should have been two extra base runners I'm still associating the weirdness of this game with the uh, impending solar eclipse tomorrow. I'm associating with the fact that the umpire thought he was he was at Alabama and not well, Auburn. That's that's part of it right. <laughs> I mean that, you're right. I had forgotten about that. Nobody in this uh, in this venue would let that one slide though. I mean there was a roaring <laughs> a chorus of boos after that. The announcement was something to the effect of Alabama is uh, challenging the call. <laughs> Well, that might be good 
in Tuscaloosa. Oh, what a pickup by the pitcher. How about that? Sneed makes a fine play. Has it not, Steve? There's a lot of things to like if you're in the Tennessee dugout. Auburn follows with a fine defensive play. McMurray down at first base with a clean and smooth and confident pluck of a difficult drive and then got it over to Gonzalez covering. Well, all of a sudden we're seeing both sides start to lay some leather out there and play defense. Haven't seen a lot of defense. Ball's been going out of the park too much. You can't you can't do anything about those defensively when they leave the ballpark. Mm -mm. Here's Hunter Ensley. And so, my goodness. Sorry. Add to this offensive total. That ball cleared the left field wall by half a block. A tremendous home run by Hunter Ensley. And that is the fourth home run of the day for this unrelenting Tennessee volunteer offense. Gracious sakes alive. Well, he was mad over being hit by a pitch twice earlier in this game and then rips one literally out of sight. That's one of the longest home runs over the left field wall I have ever seen. Insley adds to the total. That's his fourth home run, his 16th RBI. Tennessee has done this in this series like it's routine, but it's not. Seven in the second, four in the third, two in the fourth, one in the fifth, and four home runs following six homers yesterday. Steve, you're a former pitching coach. What do you do about this? Well, I have, I have a couple of thoughts I, I, before that. I, these are the kind of offensive games that you're used to seeing more west of here, you know, in Texas, in Kansas, in Oklahoma, where you, you've got wind blowing. I, you know, I, I've seen scores like this and seen offensive days like this uh, out in Lubbock, Texas. But here's in, in this part of the country, you don't usually see it. I mean, I, like we said earlier, the wind's not playing a factor in this game. This is uh, this is hitters that are that are winning the strike zone. Dean Curley has walked with the bases loaded. He has doubled and scored twice. He has flied to center field. What a play by Green. Can he finish it? He gets up and fires it, and it is completed first base. What a play by Green. What a play by McMurray again on the pluck. But we've got Caden Green down on his belly. He appears to be hurt behind second base. Watch this diving effort. He's able to recover at least long enough to get it over to first base. McMurray making a beautiful swing pluck. But Caden Green is in a lot of discomfort right now. Not certainly in a normal throwing position that it might have been with the legs that he had a problem. But thank goodness, as you say, Steve, he's able to walk off on his own power. And we go back to play with Javon Hernandez, the new second baseman. And he will bat at the bottom of the order for Caden Green. Here's Reese Chapman. He's had a good day. A walk, two runs scored, a base hit, and a strikeout. Lynn, would you agree that in football, the battle is at the line of scrimmage? Right. And, you know, it's about winning the line of scrimmage. I would. Well, in baseball... The battle is the strike zone. Mm -hmm. It's about it's about who can win, mm -hmm. who can win in the strike zone, and it's a contest. And right now, Tennessee has has really shown the ability to win the strike zone against virtually every guy that's gone out there, with the exception. I mean, this makes what John Armstrong did uh, on Friday seem like. Incomprehensible. I mean, he goes four. What he go four scoreless? Uh, I mean, right now, uh, I mean, it's hard. It's 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 been rare that that, he, that Tennessee swung and missed. Nobody uh, has been able to apply a tourniquet in this game. 
Yeah, it's a battle for that strike zone, and it, 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 it's really been that way all the way from the little league, all the way to the big leagues. And there is ball four, and now it brings up Cal Stark. He has been a bone in the. Mentioned in our interview, you know, this is a guy the pitchers have really feel comfortable with throwing. Uh, they love him behind the dish. Uh, Tennessee got a transfer out of the portal, uh, Peebles from NC State, who has just struggled at the plate. And, you know, Cal has been able to seize the opportunity, it looks like, uh, really primarily for his defense. And today it's been a. And now he's an hit by a pitch. Day. I don't know about player of the week because lots of guys have had great weeks but he's the player of the day for sure. Absolutely. It's, I was sitting there thinking about that player of the week thing earlier and I, I was thinking Christian Moore had it had it locked up but it's I would think it's going to be somebody in this lineup. Uh, I don't have a vote but. Well here is a, Christian Moore. It's a pretty this, this lineup's been pretty effective. Christian Moore followed the grand slam home run by Stark with a home run of his own back in the second inning his 13th since then he has walked and struck out he also lined out. Well, this guy Joseph was able to throw some good, good sinkers too. And he sure did and, and struck him out. He's wearing him out his side. <laughs> How about this though. We're in the fifth inning and Moore has batted five times. Yeah. They just keep turning the lineup over. You know, watching it, watching him foul that ball off his knee or foot or whatever. It's a, it's a very small victory in a game like today. And it scores like this. I really like Morris at bats the whole weekend. He 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 takes a bat through the zone really well. It's flat. He can, he's gone out of the yard up the middle to the right center. That is a that's a fair ball. Tennessee circling the bases. Here comes another run. And Christian Moore continues to torture the baseball. When does it stop for Tennessee? Maybe when it gets on the bus to leave the ballpark. Well, unfortunately, there's no clock. There's no clock in baseball. There's no free substitution. So Christian Moore with two more base hits that gives him seven in the series. That gives him three home runs and three doubles in the series. How about that? Six of your seven hits are extra bases. And I think 10 RBIs. <laughs> I'm going to need an abacus to figure it out. Is that right? 10 driven in? Yep, that's what it is. Wow. That's a month for some players. Auburn got a victory in the first inning leading three nothing but since then seven four two and three on the board for Tennessee. We've got a 16 to four ball game. Look out look out. Was somebody hit down there. There's a lot of uh, peering and looking. They're protected in the stands. We got nets all over this place with that dugout. And the whole Tennessee team came over and high fived him. Yeah, he was he was having a moment walking back through the dugout. And it's good to see that. Uh, 
on a lot of levels. I mean, that's that's class by Tennessee for sure. And it's good to see him kind of being able to walk through the dugout. But, his, I, but I know you echo my thoughts about the production and the, the zeal for quality. A absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, again, the SEC network, you know, coming on board. Let's go back and take a look at the moment just a minute ago. Ethan Stubbs accepting the uh, hearty congratulations and gratitude from that Tennessee team. There's a nice change of pace pitch and Burke is finally retired but more. let's see what Auburn can do here with Ike Irish Irish has singled and scored and he struck out in the third you know we shouldn't let it go unmentioned that we just struck Blake Burke out well that's true I think he's just tired. He has been indefatigable before that at bat. <laughs> Is that a word? <laughs> it's a lot of syllables. I know that. You know, this game will just test your metal. It'll just test you. Look at the shortstop and the second baseman. They are playing shallow center field and shallow right field, respectively, on Ike Irish. I mean, those guys are way back on the grass. Yep. If Irish bunted, he could get a double out of it. And they would be fine with him doing that. Uh, and you know, Ike, Ike has done that. Ike is a guy that will drop down a bunt. Uh, usually at times you don't want him to, <laughs> but you know, right now they're defending the field. Uh, he's going to have to. He's going to have to hit it where they're not. The 2-2, lifted into the air, in left field. Dryling is on, and he's got it. Here's Cooper McMurray. He launched a three run home run in the first inning and lined out to center field last time. He's hit the ball hard, very hard, twice. Strike one. Nate Sneed still back on the, the mound in relief. He will not figure in the decision here, but he came in after nine bullpen appearances with a five and one record, and that's the best record for Tennessee, the most wins. Unusual that it would come from a reliever. And I beg to differ with you. I think he is going to figure in the decision because the starter only went two innings. Well, that's true. I think this is how he's getting his, uh, what, what, what do we call that? Uh, we have a word for that. Well, the word for uh, Sneed right now is pretty darn good, huh? Yeah. Last year, last inning was a, a little bit of a struggle, but he's he's clearly kind of regrouped. He came in in the third. No, he's the he's the pitcher of record at this point. Yes, he is. You know, in the last couple of years of my playing career, I migrated from the starting rotation to the bullpen. And that wasn't because they were finding a new role for me. They were just getting me further away from the field. I, uh, that's when I started reading the rule book. And I, I, I learned more things about official scoring while I was sitting down there in that bullpen, you know. But, you know, who gets charged with inherited, right, inherited, right. inherited runners and things like that and pitcher of record just in case I became an official scorer. Yeah. Hey, you, you got to create some options, right? <sighs> don't, don't think I hadn't thought about that a lot in the last few years. <laughs> well, it worked out. Almost 750 victories as head coach at Baylor. Multiple 
regional appearances and super regionals, uh, a College World Series appearance, and pitching coach here at Auburn. So, yeah, whatever you did was a pretty good foundation. Well, I appreciate that. Well, that's what the note that uh, you just handed me said. <laughs> you didn't read all of it, though. There's, there's something on the other side, too. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'll try to get to that next inning. <laughs> I'm calling this the solar eclipse game. What are the scores around the league looking like? Is everybody having a Sunday like this? 16 to 4 Tennessee after trailing 3 nothing. How's it going in Starkville after that that game they they had last night? That was uh let me see if I can find some other SEC I mean, scores. I mean, they finished that game with pitchers hitting. I mean, Georgia uh, Georgia won that game striking out a Mississippi State pitcher to end the game. There wasn't anybody else left to put, on, put up there. Well, there also was a brouhaha, which resulted in uh, several suspensions I don't, yesterday. I think it was more of a ha-ha than a brew. Well, suspensions announced. For Georgia Mississippi State baseball there were two players suspended for Mississippi State and three for Georgia. It was an eighth inning altercation. There's a base hit for Stanfield with two outs. So he had struck out twice before that but responds in his third at bat. You know this is a year when NCAA is 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 emphasizing sportsmanship and emphasizing you know especially celebration rule celebration stuff um, and so anytime you do that it really puts the umpires I think um, sometimes in a bad spot um, because they're they're being asked to emphasize something in a particular year and in inevitably you get some bizarre things happening whether it's emphasizing a bulk rule or you're uh, emphasizing positioning on the rubber uh, the slide rule all this kind of stuff it gets emphasized you know from one year to the next and this year it's 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 sportsmanship and you know I didn't see the play at the plate last night but it sounds like there was a a little bit of an intimidation involved in that from the catcher and then it just kind of turns into a a 45 minute delay in the game which you know nobody wants that but. well players from both uh, benches converged on the plate area and uh, that's a no no and and it should be yep. for sure and uh, after the tape was reviewed uh, two players from Mississippi State were ejected and subject to suspension and they have been suspended and three from Georgia. So you just don't like to see that and and I admit Steve that that there there are a lot of games and a lot of years under my belt but I abhor the uh, the tendency now for athletes to uh, to showboat to taunt to disregard sportsmanship and if that sounds old fashioned I don't apologize because I just think that's not what the game should be about anytime. There's a liner to center field. Mainers hits it pretty well, but it's caught by Ensley, and we move on. It's a big lead for Tennessee, 16 to 4. This appears to be Luke Payne. Well, let's see. Let me check that. It's Petrovic. Yeah. Big right hander from Cypress, Texas. Another of the of the freshman arms down there that I think has a chance to to really develop. You know, one of the one of the thing the the run rule. There's so many shortened games now that you you don't have. Some, some, there's not enough innings. You know, sometimes to get guys the work they need. And the the SEC is not a development league. No, it's be good or be gone pretty much, right? Yeah. So Alex Petrovic, the freshman, brings it, and that's a good curveball, but it doesn't find the plate. 
So it's been Cannon and Carlson and Tilly and Gonzalez and now Petrovic. That's there for a strike. straight back this way when you've been doing this for a long time what's uh, what's the pitch clock done to the game I like it I, I like it thoroughly and by nature I've always been a traditionalist when it comes to baseball but I think baseball had tilted the clock so to speak uh, to the detriment of, of fans and while it hurt me to say that these rules are needed there's a good pitch and a strikeout looking so Dryling is called out on strikes. As we take a look at uh, the freshman Alex Petrovic out of Cypress, Texas, a big guy, a 6'5", 232 pounder. And no record, a three and a half ERA, only seven and two thirds innings. He has surrendered 10 hits, but look at the strikeout total, about two, a, two an inning, close to it. And only two walks, 13 to two, that's really good strikeouts to walks. Yeah, he's he's got a chance. Just needs some some work. This summer will probably be a, a a big opportunity for him. And I don't I don't mean to discount this game or the rest of the season, but a lot of guys in this situation that are not getting a bunch of work during the season. Uh oh, this yeah. one is drilled. Could it be home run number five? Yes, it is. That is in the bullpen as Cabarrus tears. Collects his first hit of the day after walking twice and scoring twice. And Tennessee, which had six home runs yesterday, has just crashed its fifth today. And for Tears, that is home run number 10. So this 400 hitter joins three other teammates with double digit home run totals. That's a murderer's row. One through four have hit 10 or more home runs already this season for Tennessee. This team right now, Tennessee, is hotter than a fire ant on a fever blister. <laughs> it's incredible, the offensive performance. The pitch dribbled foul to Bargo. But Steve, just to continue the response to your question, I, I do think the speed up rules, as alien as they might have been at first, are, uh, are, are very good for baseball. And it's cut off 22 minutes on the average time of a game, even more in the major leagues. And they're trying to speed it up additionally. They've cut the pitch clock back by two or three seconds. Look out, a whirly bird to the right side. But but yes, I, I, I think the speed up the so-called speed up rules to me, they shouldn't be called speed up rules. They should be called natural rules because I think baseball had gotten into a, a, a bad habit of just stretching things when it was unnecessary. You know, I, I spent uh, 22 part is part of 23 in, pro, in professional baseball and I was in, in player development and so saw a lot of minor league baseball and all of the things that are being implemented in the big leagues now they were first tested mm -hmm, there mm -hmm. and uh, and it shortened games up uh, in the minor leagues tremendously uh, and their rules were even a little uh, I mean you could pick there was limitations there on number of picks uh, you could pick twice if you picked a third time and you didn't get him out he would it automatically advance the runner so oh wow it, it really um, the running game became interesting to watch uh, but you had that in addition to uh, in addition to clock and it definitely sped the game up but you know right now we're, we're all used to it and this just seems like a normal pace it doesn't seem like oh we're hurrying 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 I, I mean this is not an egregious shortening of the game you know it, 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 it has not in my opinion it has not drastically affected the way the game is played uh, the only people who who don't like the speed up rules are the concession folks who work on commission. <laughs> 
Well, you know, part of what's in the college game right now, you you can disengage, you can disengage one time, uh, and so what you see a lot of a lot of times, there's no limit on picks. I'll finish that on the on the other side. The team were over Auburn in this rubber match of the three game series. Steve Smith, Len Rollins with you. We are very appreciative you have stuck around and uh, watching the final innings of this game. Right now we are within that uh, 10 run window for a run shortened of a, a game that would be influenced by the 10 run rule. And that of course would come after seven. Yeah, then we were talking about the speed up stuff and I'll finish my thought that in uh, that's well hit. Well, let's see if this one carries. Yes, it does. It's off the batter's eye. And Gavin Miller, who had lined out to left and was robbed of a base hit by a fine play by the shortstop Curly, smashes one to straightaway center field, high off the batter's eye. And the Auburn Tigers, although they trail by a lot, trying to get an offense reestablished. That's the second home run of the game. The first one came from McMurray. Got a fastball up. He stayed on top of it and hit it very well. That's home run number three. RBI number nine. Gavin Miller only making his ninth start and his 18th appearance. And that's good stuff. You could hang laundry on that line drive. There's a lot of good hitters on both these clubs. Indeed. Here's Carter Wright. He doubled in a run last time and he drops a flare over the head of the first baseman. That's a base hit. Wright needs to get back to the bag because the catcher Stark was trying to sneak in behind him on that big turn. And so back, you know, a 17 to 5 game, but. I think the guys in the bullpen out there, I think they're asleep right now. So he's he might want to be on his game right here if he don't want to, if he doesn't want to get tagged with a few runs. Well, this is his fourth inning of relief. And so he's probably near the end of uh, his plan to stint, although of course the lead is substantial. Ugh. Out at second. Out at first. Around the horn it went. Vargo, Moore, and Burke turned it over. 5 4 3. And so that snuffs the effort by Auburn offensively. Uh, outs 1 and 2 following the home run by Miller. And here batting for the first time is Javon Hernandez. Hernandez came into the game a couple of innings ago after Christian or excuse me after uh, Green was injured making a fine play moving to his right. That's hit hard right at his counterpart at second base and picked up by Moore and thrown out. I'm holding on to its spot as it's in a tailspin right now but. Kentucky yep. swept Alabama this weekend and the Wildcats have lost one. SEC game. That's remarkable. And they come to town next weekend. Yes. So it, it doesn't get any easier. There's no place on the on an SEC schedule to get healthy or to get well. You just gotta just gotta fight through it. This is the uh, third game in a seven game homestand for Auburn. Alabama State will be the next opponent. That'll be Tuesday. And that is a six o'clock game central daylight saving time. And then April 11th 12th and 13th the first place Kentucky Wildcats come to town. Games on Thursday at 630 Friday at six and Saturday at two. And actually this is the first the third game in an eight game homestand because Georgia Tech will uh, be here on Tuesday April 16th. But a Thursday, Friday, Saturday date with Kentucky coming up next weekend for Auburn and uh, the Wildcats in the SEC. Boy, that's that's going to be a good week of baseball, huh? Go 
You know, it's, I know for them down there, it's just hard to think about that right now. This is a really, a really tough stretch. Another smash by Curley, and this one is gone. It's off the scoreboard. Wow. The home run hit parade continues. It's the second home run of the game. And this has just been remarkable. Is that six again today? Yep. And nothing cheap about it. Dean Curley. And the lead advances to 18 to 5. So two of them sailed over the wall in the second inning. The grand slam by Stark, followed by the home run by Moore. And then home run number three in the game was Stark again, a three-run homer in the fourth. And then the home run by Inslee, the home run by Tears, and the home run by Curley. My goodness. How many games do you go back-to-back -back with six homers? That is really rare. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm looking down there to the third base coach for Tennessee. Josh Elander uh, played at TCU, Round Rock, Texas. Uh, he and Tony's relationship go back to TCU days. Josh was a, a pretty good professional prospect. Uh, I think I think minor league player of the year at one time with the Braves. And you know, for all the the. Uh, Praise we give Tony. I think on a on a weekend like this, the the job that Josh Erlander's done with these hitters and with Tennessee is you, you just got to tip your hat to him. Well, Robin Villeneuve is uh, is batting for Chapman. Chapman walked twice, singled, scored three times, and struck out. You know, Chapman had four chances to hit it out of the park and didn't, so he's going to get pinch hit for. <laughs> You know, Tony's done a pretty interesting thing this weekend. I mean, he's he's got depth. He he, he uh -oh. knows he's got more depth position player wise than he's ever had. And so there, especially in that DH role, he has he has pinch hit in that role every game. Uh, guy gets a couple of at bats uh, and doesn't you know it doesn't look like he's swinging well that day. He goes to his next guy. And I'm not saying that's that's not what he's doing here with Chapman. He's he, Chapman's had four good at bats or at least three struck out that first time. But he's uh, he's he's got depth. And again, it's a run rule game. So if you're going to get guys at bats and get them on the mound, you just got to find ways to do it. How many players do you think have reached base for Tennessee today? It took me a minute and a half to figure it out. Well, they ain't left that many on. Uh, 27 base runners for Tennessee. Okay. So they've only left nine on. That's not that many when you score 18. Can you believe that? 27 <laughs> base runners? I don't want to think about it. Uh, you know? I really don't. I've always thought hitting was hard. <laughs> well, it is most days. There you go. Now go to second. There you go. The tag must be applied. It is. That's the hard way to get the double play. The nice Three play. for the force and then the throw up to the shortstop. By the way, that was Cannon Peebles who was batting for Stark. I guess it's not enough to homer twice and double. You don't get a chance to uh, to homer three times. Nope. Uh, 
again, he's looking for chances to get guys off that bench and, and get, get them in at bat. How about Stark's day, though? A grand slam, a three-run homer, and a double. He was hit by a pitch. He went three for three, drove in seven, scored four runs. That's at the bottom of the order, by the way. And another pinch hitter up at the plate, drives this one up and off the wall. And that's going to be a double. And this has just been a remarkable supply of extra base hits. Look at what's occurred in the last 14 innings. Not even two complete games. 12 homers. 30 runs scored. Mm. I mean, some of these are slow pitch softball numbers that Tennessee has been able to apply. You know, I remember a Sunday game back in, in 19. We played Auburn. We played over at Mississippi State, and we lost that game. I think it was 15 to 10. And here is another ball launched deep to right center field, carrying, carrying, carrying. It's off the warning track. And Tennessee just continues to punish the baseball. That was uh, Bradkey Laurie who got that previous base hit. And now this is Blake Burke again. It's just remarkable. It's hard to describe what we've seen offensively in this series by Tennessee. Ben's a Auburn guy to the core, was a, is a converted catcher. So came here as a catcher and has made the move to the mound. Uh, got the final out yesterday, I believe, and is getting an opportunity to get, the, get that today. He's a guy that's a, and I, and I don't want to discount his ability on the field because I'm not doing that, but he is he's such a special kid and such a special guy to the whole team. Uh, that even in a game like this, you've got a whole dugout over there that is, is excited to see him out there and is pulling for him. He's pitching to the pinch hitter, Colby Backus, out of Johnson City, Tennessee. And there's a strike. And that moves the count to one and two with two outs, a runner at second base. Tennessee has scored in every inning since the first. Uh, you got a clock violation. Bacchus is hitting 417 with limited at bats. He's had five hits. One of them has gone out of the ballpark. Correction, he didn't get a violation. He had a disengagement. This is the 13th at bat for the pinch hitter Bacchus. Wide stance at the plate, the pitch. Chop to the left side in the hole. Wibara straightens up, throws over to first in time for the out. Nicely done by Eric Wibara. And we move forward with Tennessee leading 19 to 5 and only two walks. So a little tune up action for Andrew Bainke with a 14 run lead. Cooper Weiss at the plate. So you got you got two teams right here that whose goals right now are are a little bit different. This is yanked a long way, but twisting foul by a very big margin, but well hit by Cooper Weiss. He singled twice and bounced out one to three. So a two for three day working with a run scored that came in the first inning obviously. 
back to my thought. So, I mean, Tennessee over there with the club they've got right now, the way they're playing, they're thinking Omaha National Championship. Sure. And so, you know, this Binky, the left-hander, he's, he's a different look. Uh, he's not out there because the score of the game is like this. He's out there uh, because they think they're going to need him. Uh, you know, there's going to be some meaningful outs that they're going to need him to get, uh, and they needed to use this opportunity to do it. You know, the game's going to get shortened, but they can't let him sit over there. Uh, Sneed's not out of the game because he couldn't perform. He's out of the game because he needed to get somebody else out there. Sneed would be the winner. Bainke trying to finish up here after a nice play by Curley at shortstop. And here is Ike Irish. Yeah, your comments about the crowds uh, earlier were not lost on me. As a guy who, who spent a lot of years in that dugout, uh, just so appreciate fans that'll hang behind a team when it's not going the way they want it to go. It takes a special person to be a, a baseball fan. You know, the game of baseball really teaches you how to deal with losing because even the best teams are going to lose 25, 30 percent of their games. Football teams, you know, it's how do you handle winning because you're great. You're great teams in football. They don't ever lose. If they do, it's once. But baseball teams have got to they've got to learn to be resilient. And, uh, and to be a great fan of the game, you've got to, you've kind of got to take on that that posture as that the player does, and that's that's what sort of jumps out here. Auburn has always been known as a great football school, great football program. You know, Coach Pearl has has turned it into a, a basketball power as well, and 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 Butch is with two trips to Omaha in the last five years has. You know, put them on the map in baseball. And hey, that women's basketball team is coming too. Well, no disrespect to them. I, I and thank you for mentioning that. But it's um, it's just good. It's just encouraging to see uh, the fans today just hang with them. Here's Cooper McMurray, who had that three-run home run in the first, and he has lined out to center and struck out. And the pitch. Right there for a strike. Banky has a little bit of an unusual motion. It's kind of a slow slide step, if you will. What? Watch his very deliberate, short, little st quick step back. Not much of a leg kick. Kind of holds it there for a second. It's like a slide step, except it's uh, in slow motion. Yeah, it, it's a pause. He could actually probably start and restart his delivery, Johnny Cueto uh, style, if you will. Uh, and in doing that, he's running a fastball up there up to 91. So we're not, we're not talking about a guy that's thumbing it up there in a 18 to 5 game. We're talking about a guy who's, who's got some ability and they're going to need. This should do it. Hensley is there, and this game is over in favor of Tennessee. So what was a promising start for Auburn